and hi. It's a really long time since I was here. Yeah, once I was sitting there, and it seems like a million years ago. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about this stuff. Uh, it's a bit about masculinity and a bit about violence and, and, and a lot about bullies. And it's, it's part of a big problem that's been interesting to me, which is violence in South Africa. But, you know, when people talk about violence in South Africa, they talk about the, the big stuff. They talk about the kind of anime voice and the terrible, horrific mutilations, rapes, you know, children getting shot when burglars come into their houses. And the problem with that kind of talk is that it stops people talking about the other violence, the kind of violence that just goes on, like every day. Um, the, 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 the sort of low-level ways in which people are just really shit to each other and mean and abusive. Um, and that interests me much more uh, in terms of trying to understand what, what, what's going on. So what I've done with this paper is um, looking, I, 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 I started just looking at an uh, online discussion um, about an incident of bullying that was reported in the newspaper. And from a, from a sort of social researcher point of view, the internet's just fantastic because people say stuff that you could never get them to say in an interview. You know, when you, you do typical social science things and interview people, and they, they just tell you what they think will make a good impression on you. A, a lot of the interviews starts becoming about, like, oh, they want you to think about them in a certain way. On the internet, people will just say any shit. I mean, you just have to log on to YouTube and read the comments under almost any video to see that there's no holds barred in terms of the, the stupidity, the bigotry, um, and the sheer irrelevance of, 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 of the kind of yakking that will start going on. And, and that stuff's really interesting, actually. It's precisely that kind of um, inexplicable um, accounts of things that, that, that when, as soon as you look at them, they just don't make sense. Um, that, that really helps us get at how people are thinking, how people are doing the kind of ordinary, everyday thinking. So um, that's why this debate interested me. And it also interested me because there was, a, it, it escalated very quickly into a kind of a flame war. And, and the, um, uh, when I printed out the comments, they went on for about 22 pages. And that, that's one day of, of comments in reaction to an article about an incident that happened at Parktown Boys in Joburg, which is a very, very fancy elite school, um, where um, the, a couple of the boys got beaten up, hospitalized, and the school didn't really do anything. One of the moms eventually went to the press. The press got hold of the story and uh, published an account of what had happened, and then all hell, hell breaks loose. And I'm not interested in the incident. Um, but I'm not going to talk about the motivations of the perpetrator or the trauma of the victim. I'm interested in this, in this uh, public debate that happened. Okay. And immediately we see two, two, two camps forming. And the one camp, interestingly to me, is defending uh, the, this incident of, uh, or this range of incidents of, on violence. Um, the kind of the bullying, the, the, the very abusive initiation that was taking place. And they say a number of things. Firstly, they go into denial, which is a, a, a classic tactic. Um, and they start saying, the, this, the, these reports are complete and utter nonsense. Then they go to the second step, which is, 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 is the ad hominem attacks, the attacks on the, on the people who, who leak the information. And the idea that it's becoming a public debate. That bringing the media into it is downright vindictive and disgusting. Um, so there's a real sense that, that even the, the, the first line of attack is, well, it never happened. The second line of attack is, well, okay, maybe it happened, but really this is not a matter for public debate. We don't hang out dirty laundry in public. And then the, the, the third line of debate is attacking the people who um, were talking about it and saying, parents who are complaining are the ones who were sissies themselves. And, and this starts getting really interesting because I start being very interested in what a sissy is and what work that idea does um, for us. Um, so they argue that bullying and initiation aren't really harmful. And going on to say things like, a couple of smacks will not hinder future success. And initiations are there to build character and make you part of a team. And this becomes a really interesting kind of talk that starts going on, this idea of character building. Okay, it becomes a fundamental theme that starts coming out in the comments. 
um, that, 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 that initiation, and build, uh, initiation and bullying are about creating a certain kind of person. Okay. And then the sort of defense uh, kicks in. It was done to us, so we will do it to them. It builds character. And the idea that uh, one of the parents said that he'd rather see his son whacked on the backside of the hockey stick than have, have, have him hanging out in a drug-infested nightclub. This is also the kind of you know, thing that people just blurt out. And, and it's quite interesting because it sets up a, a, a choice that either, you, either, you, either kids get beaten or they become criminals, delinquents, drug addicts, all kinds of other things. And, and that's really the, 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 the parental choice. You, you either beat them or, or, you, or you just watch them kind of drop out of society and become dysfunctional. But what's interesting is um, this notion of character and this notion of, um, uh, that I mentioned this word sissies that starts creeping in there, start clearly becoming about a, a idea of masculinity um, that is behind these arguments. Okay, so one of the, the uh, contributors says, initiation produces men, not girls. And another one says, boys will be boys, so please get over it and let your kids grow up. Now this is, this is, really significant because here we're getting a dichotomy between the genders okay we're getting we're getting the difference between men and uh, between um, masculinity and femininity and specifically this interesting idea that the function of that violence is to produce a desirable kind of masculinity um, and the idea that it's specifically appropriate for boys to be violently victimized that if it were girls, then maybe there would be grounds for intervening, but because it's boys, that's just part of what you have to do to grow up as a guy. And it seems that underneath this is a concept of masculinity, that men should be autonomous, aggressive, they should be able to defend themselves, um, they should be able to attack other people. And of course it's strongly opposed to a notion of femininity, that women are, are, are weak, they're vulnerable, they need support from other people. Um, and so we, we, we see this um, talk of um, that, that, that juxtaposition happening around these words sissy and, and a phrase that comes up surprisingly often, this idea of running to mommy. This is something that, that, that young boys who are failing to be men do. They run to their mommies, okay? They seek external support in times of crisis. Um, and it seems that one of the essential characteristics of being this kind of man is that you shouldn't do that, okay? You should deal with stuff on your own, and you should deal with it using aggression. So, here we, we, we see the sort of formation of this idea that, um, that uh, masculinity and aggression are, are, are quite deeply linked, but, but not in a kind of a way that people are worried about, in a way that people are, are quite happy with. Then to get on to the, 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 the sort of justifications, and this is quite interesting because what we start seeing is justifications from experience. And, and it would seem that this is a good place to start. I mean, what better place to justify something than to say, yes, but it's, I know that because I've been through it, and this is the outcome. I mean, that, that on the surface of it sounds like a good, a good grounds for justification. Um, and um, the idea that experience is a, is, is a starting point um, seems to be one that really needs to be looked at very, very closely here. Um, so, so, they, so, the, so these defenders of the bullying would go on to say, I went through three different initiations that built camaraderie and made me feel part of the system and made me a man, not a sniveling sissy, uh, made a man, not a sniveling sissy out of me. So once again, we see the, the, the man and sissy. These are two different kinds of things. There's a good masculinity and a bad masculinity, or even non-masculinity. Um, I would be more humiliated by my mom coming to my defense than taking a good lashing in front of everyone else. And, and here again, this idea of, um, I'm not going to run to mommy. Uh, I don't want my mom to come to my defense. I want to just take the pain, and by taking the pain, I will establish my masculinity um, within the social world. The other positive outcomes that are argued um, are this, this idea that it, it, it builds skills and of course the repetition again and again of the idea that it, that it builds character. But also we see there this idea of the camaraderie, that it, um, it makes people feel part of a social organization. A really interesting idea that when you are 
abusive to people in collective environments, it actually makes them identify with that group. It doesn't make them identify away from the group, which is what you might have expected. You know, if a, if a social system treats someone badly, they might want to leave. This argument says no, it actually embeds them even more um, in, that, in, in that little social world. So that line of argument is the one side of this flame war. The other side is um, the people who really aren't happy with this. Um, and they start saying things like, this outdated and horrific practice should be banned. They're interested in the word outdated. It means that once upon a time, this kind of thing was okay, but now we don't really think it's okay anymore. Um, and how shameful to let physical violence be a norm in a school. And uh, once again, the interesting notion, the notion of a norm, that you're taking acts, firstly, that are recognized as violent, and secondly, that you normalize it when you say it's okay for us to be violent in these kinds of ways. Um, for, the arguments taken further, most shocking of all are the parents defending this behavior. That adults condone, condone it is very worrying, and I'm disgusted at the thought that there are people out there who are okay with beating, <coughs> bullying, and barbarism. So the argument here is very clear that this bullying is just not on, okay, it's got to, it, it, it's totally unacceptable, it's got to stop. Particularly the role of adults who, are, are, the, the implied argument here is that adults should be protecting children from harm, in fact what they're doing is condoning it. Um, and then an interesting a group of people come to the defense of the initial whistleblower who is, who is suffering these kind of personal attacks from the other group and they, they say that um, uh, she's very courageous in exposing this violent behavior and addressing her directly online, say, you did a good job, you protected your son as any parent could. So, 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 so here a kind of protective team is getting, getting mobilized, really affirming that that mom who exposed the violence in the school system is, is, is actually the one who's doing the right thing. Now, what's interesting with that, 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 with that side of the argument is a lot of the people making those arguments are self-evidently mothers. It, it, it's very clear from the kind of argument that, that, that's being, being made. Um, and, and, and there's a, there's a real gender significance there that we want to look at um, a bit more. But let's look at some more of these arguments. That no same person can think it's all right for another person to bully another. I can't see how physically harming so another person creates unity and makes them grow. Now you see this is a direct counter-argument against the camaraderie and the character build. Um, and then the, this is not the kind of education that builds character, it builds thugs. So interestingly, we, 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 both of these positions are saying yes, this experience does have outcomes. It has outcomes on kind of identity and social behavior, but the argument is that it has different outcomes. So whereas the first group are saying the outcome is character building, the second group are saying that the outcome is that it build people who are antisocial. Um, and implied in this is an interesting theory that has sort of come out of psychology and now become part of popular culture, which is a theory of cycles of violence. Okay. Um, and one reader points out something that's at the heart of this analysis. The only people who seem to approve of this outrageous situation are the old boys. This speaks volumes about the damage done to them. They are now inflicting this on the next generation. And when you look at that comment, there's a very elaborate psychological theory underneath that. Um, and it is this, it's, it's, it's a kind of a traumatic theory of violence and of cycles of violence, saying that um, the, the, the people defending it are people who've been through it. And the reason that happens is because the experience damaged them to the point where they can't recognize its harmfulness anymore. But it's affected them in a negative way that is making them cause that same harm to other people. Okay? Um, and, and, and there's a whole sort of psychological literature, especially uh, originally a psychodynamic literature, um, that was at once, that at one historical point regarded as very, very kind of technical and even a little bit implausible, which has now just become a kind of a cultural common sense that we can talk in this, in this sort of way. Um, Here's, a, here's an example of, of, of this kind of thing that they're talking about. One of the, one of the uh, people in the debates says, when I was at school, new boys were subject to sadistic initiation rituals. It was part of a violent authoritarian culture, note those words, violent and authoritarian culture, that included teachers beating pupils until they fled, people sexually abusing other pupils. 
I sincerely hope that with the advent of democracy and human rights, these days would be behind us. Once again, see the, the argument about time. Oh, it used to be okay to do that, but it's not okay anymore. But apparently they are not. Most disturbing is reports that pupils and ex-pupils defend initiation rituals on the basis that they build character and make you a man. No. They make you an abuser. Is this the idea of manhood we want to instill in our youth? So there you see very clearly that the, 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 the experience has this effect, that being bullied makes you a bully, being abused makes you an abuser. This, this, um, this recycles of violence theory. And, and, and here we get to, to something which I'm really trying to get at in the paper, is this, this notion that a certain idea of manhood is being defended, one can, in fact, might want to say perpetrated uh, in the social environment. So, what can we see? We can see that there's, there, there, there's two polar opposite sides of the argument. But when we look at them, each of them has a, has a preferred notion of masculinity, and each of them has a theory of violence. Um, the question I then want to ask, um, which is the point of this paper, is, is, is how did they end up with these different positions? Why isn't there a kind of a general consensus um, about how these things work? Um, why, do, why, does the, why is the one group so convinced that what's going on with the school bullying is something that's terribly dangerous socially, and why is the other group equally convinced that what's going on is, is actually not only acceptable, it's highly desirable and must be defended? And as soon as we ask that question, we get back to the question that one of the, the, the participants in the debate um, raised, which is why is it that it's usually the victims of the bullying that go on to defend it. The people who weren't bullied tend to be less inclined to defend it than people who were. And this seems to be a critical factor that we need to make some sort of analytic sense of. Okay, now, from the point of view of psychology as a research discipline, there's no debate. Um, there is, the, the, there's nothing like this debate within psychological literature. The, the, the research for the last 60 years has been pretty much unanimous that those kinds of abusive experiences lead to negative psychological outcomes. And, they, and they've documented a range of outcomes in schools. It actually worsens um, academic performance. It has long-term <coughs> effects on self-esteem, on, on interpersonal relationships. And there's a strong link between those sorts of experience and later um, social behavior, or we could in fact say antisocial behavior. There's a link between those sorts of victimizations and an increased risk of becoming a perpetrator of violence. So that's a kind of consensus within psychology, which doesn't exist out there in society, in, in common sense. And it's, and it's that gap that, that seems to be interesting to me. Um, but some of the readers do seem plugged into that, and maybe some of them are even people who kind of sat in this kind of lecture theater and did some undergrad psychology or picked up some psychology from like Oprah or some, somewhere out there. There's like this noise of, of popular psychology that, that, that gives people explanatory frameworks. Um, and they say, yeah, that, 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 that this bullying is, is creating future criminals who might beat up women. Notice the emphasis uh, on, on women there. Or start a fight in a local club. Um, they're in danger of becoming habitual bullies and sadists. Or, and this gets really interesting, police, private security or bouncers where they can practice their pathetic insecurities. So, so look at that. That's actually quite a, uh, there's a, there's, there's quite a lot of theory packed into that last statement. He's saying that, that there's certain professions that allow people to, to engage in socially legitimated forms of violence. Okay, so you can become a bouncer, and then it's your job to be violent. Okay? And that, 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 that certain people, because are psychologically predisposed to, to those kinds of professions, because they are psychologically damaged. And the nature of the psychological damage is identified at the end there. It's a pathetic insecurity. Okay? Now that's really interesting, because this is a new line of argument. This is saying that in fact all this um, all this aggression that's coming out is a reaction to something else. It's a reaction to a insecurity. It's a reaction to a vulnerability. Um, and, and we need to see if we can make sense of that uh, a little bit more. 
Which brings us really to our core issue of masculinity. Um, now, what's interesting about this stuff is that it's not just the bullying acts that are approved of. It's not like, oh, it's okay to do that. Um, and it's not just the, the, the act of bullying another learner that, that gives someone kind of status within the school system. It's the fact that those acts um, establish a certain kind of masculine identity. So it's not the fact that, that oh, I, I, you know, I, I bullied this person in this kind of way. It's like, oh, the, the fact that I can bully someone in that kind of way makes me a certain kind of man. And that kind of man is a kind of man who is given social status within those kinds of systems. So the link between the acts of violence and the identity that those acts of violence kind of prop up, I think is really critical here. And, 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 and what identity is this? It's a masculine identity where we, we, which, which, which um, depends on aggression rather than cooperation, on dominance rather than equality, on strength rather than weakness. On, on hardness and toughness rather than vulnerability, on autonomy rather than dependence, and on stoic endurance rather than emotionality. So, so all of these, 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 this whole cluster of masculinity, it's around, it's really around not being vulnerable, around being in control, having access to force that you can use on other people, and to, and, and, and to create a kind of system of social inequality through the ability to exercise violence, but what's interesting about it is that it seems to require from the outset a violence against oneself. Um, uh, and that particularly we see that in the fact that it, 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 it mustn't allow sort of self-weakness, it mustn't allow self-vulnerability, it mustn't allow uh, dependence on other people, and it mustn't allow um, emotions to be revealed. Especially, well, it mustn't allow sort of vulnerable emotions, it can allow aggressive uh, emotions to be revealed. Um, and it becomes very clear when we look at the specific wording that's used in these debates that, that, that the, this, this key term, the notion of a real man um, that is being defended by the people who, are, who, who like the bully is, is very, very clearly the opposite of a whole lot of other words that, that, that circulate in society. And these are specifically extremely pejorative words. These are words that are only used as insults, okay? That being a real man means not being a sissy, a wimp, a morphy, a crybaby, a ninny, a pussy. And when we look at all of those words, um, the offense in all of them <coughs> is that those are all things that are associated with a certain notion of femininity. I mean, being a real man means not being a girl. Because all of those things, being a pussy or a ninny or a crybaby, it means that, it, it, that, that, that one, is, one, one is adopting a kind of masculinity that has, has feminine elements in it. And this is the thing that is absolutely not being allowed to happen. This is the thing that the, the whole point of the violence is to prevent that outcome. So how does this relate to our question, which is, the, the, the question of why it's the people who have been bullied that, be, that, that, that become bullies. Why do some victims of bullying become bullies and others don't? So you see, we've, we've, we've created a differentiation here, because our cycle of violence theory says that people who have, have this kind of traumatic experience of violence and abuse end up at a high risk of becoming bullies. But they don't all. They don't all become abusers. Some do, and there is a, 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 some statistical correlation there. And then a whole lot of them don't. Okay. And they react in a number of different ways. And one of the ways in which they react to it is become people who actively oppose that sort of thing. People who, act, who, who, who speak out against it, people um, who, 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 who commit themselves to actually saying, no, what, what happened over there was wrong, and I'm going to make sure that it stops happening. I'm going to make sure that I never treat my kids in the way that my parents treated me. I'm going to make sure that when my kids go to school, they don't have to go through that kind of stuff. Um, so this is this, this is absolutely kind of split um, in the in the possible reactions, and, and and the question is how are we to make sense of that 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 psychologically, and here we get into the sort of uh, psychological meat and potatoes of this analysis, which is really a psychodynamic analysis. I'm drawing very heavily on ideas from from uh, sort of broad psychoanalysis. Um, to, to identify certain um, psychological mechanisms that take place. And the first one I want to talk about is idealization. Okay? And this notion that um, 
one of the things that kids do, and, and you, can, you can usually see this very clearly, is, is they, they idealize the adults around them. They idealize their own parents. Um, to the extent that, you know, one of the most offensive insults you can often give to people is to insult their mother. You know, think about it. How many of those terrible things that, uh, the, the provocations um, to, to people, like someone trying to start a fight, is to insult someone's mother? Um, because it offends against this, 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 this sort of tendency um, to, of, of, of children to idealize their caregivers. Now what's interesting about that is that psychologists at a certain point started noticing that kids who are abused actually idealize their caregivers even more than kids who aren't. And you'd have thought the opposite. You'd have thought kids who have bad relationships with their caregivers wouldn't idealize them. Not so. They idealize them even more. To the extent that it, it's, it can even be diagnostic, yeah. Sorry, with abused children, is it emotional or physical abuse? Well, it, it could be anything, yeah. I mean, we're keeping this really open-ended. So we're including physical abuse, including sexual abuse as a kind of physical abuse, but certainly, definitely including emotional abuse. And emotional abuse can take many, many forms. And one of the forms that emotional abuse can take is simple neglect. Okay, that simply doing nothing at all can be one of the most abusive things you can do to children. Um, to the extent that, 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 um, no, I'm not going to go in that detail. I'm going to okay, we'll hit back on this. Okay, so, so, so this, this weird sort of mechanism of idealization. Um, and, and the other thing that, 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 that um, people in the, working in the area of trauma studies have found out is that this idealization actually doesn't only happen in childhood, it happens all over the place. For instance, there's a thing called the Stockholm Syndrome, which refers specifically to the way in which people who've been uh, threatened and held captive, like people who've been kidnapped or, or something, uh, and things like that, instead of talking about how terrible the people who were holding a gun against their heads and tying them up were, they talk about how nice they were. They were like, oh no, yeah, he, I mean, he did tie us up for three days, but they gave us food, you know, and they let us go to the toilet. I mean, actually, they were really decent people. And, you know, as an outsider, you say, yeah, but you were tied up and there was a gun against your head, they were threatening to kill you at any moment. Uh, doesn't, don't, don't, don't you feel kind of bad about that? And then, no, no, I understand why they were doing that, but actually, they were, they, they were really treating us well. And, 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 and this is a kind of, a, it's a, this is what's called the, the Stockholm Syndrome, this, this sort of strange idea that people kind of idealize people who, 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 who are threatening them. And really interesting because you see this happening systematically in, in social networks. For instance, uh, examples I give there are in armies and cults. All armies work the same way, is they, they, they work by systematically abusing people who enter the system, okay? You take them out of their protective social environment, you put them in a hostile environment, you strip away everything about them. You, t you strip away their clothes, you cut their hair, you take their name away, preferably, give them a rank and a number, um, then you subject them to these various kinds of physical abuse, uh, physical overexertion, sleep deprivation, verbal abuse. Um, and the interesting thing is, you would think that um, when you do that to people, they would, um, they would go hey, well. they would just run away. They're like, okay, I, I think I made a bad decision here, I'm going to go home where it's nice. Um, but they don't do that. What, what, what they do is they become obsessively loyal towards the organization and they become patriotic and nationalistic and, and really identifying with the, with, with the violence of, of, of the organization, which is, which is of course what you want at that point. Because at that point you can get them so kind of caught up with the identification with the organizations, you can get them to do what they wouldn't otherwise normally do, which is to kill people, which is what armies are for. I mean, it's a mechanism for organizing people to kill other people. Um, and so you need to do quite a lot of, of psychological work. And interestingly, the way you do it is by being abusive to them, not by rewarding them or anything like that. I mean, you can, you can build that into it too, but, but the abuse is really critical. So, there seems to be this deep psychological <coughs> reflex of idealization in the face of abuse. And what's interesting is, when, once we've said that, suddenly these comments start making sense. Okay, now, now look at this comment now, thinking about the concept of idealization. I was in an old boys' hostel and enjoyed reminiscing about the days of being beaten and tortured. 
Okay, immediately reading that, my impression is this guy's taking the piss, okay, because...